Brethren, welcome to Shabbat Services, and it's good to have everybody back with us again today. And today we're going to start a three-part study series on the sons of God, or the sons of the Mighty One. And let us understand who is being referred to when we study this in Scripture, and what this actually means to us from an understanding of, of who these people were in history, and what they will be and what they will do in the future. So please turn with me to the Gospel of Mark, and we'll start in Mark chapter 1 and verse 1. Mark 1, starting in verse 1. The beginning of the Gospel of Yehoshua the Messiah, the Son of the Mighty One, as it is written in the prophets, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way before you, the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of Yehovah, make his path straight. John came baptizing in the wilderness and preaching a baptism of repentance for the remission of sins. And all the land of Judea and those from Jerusalem went out to him and were all baptized by him in the Jordan River, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and with a leather belt around his waist and he ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, There comes one after me who is mightier than I, whose sandal strap I am not worthy to stoop down and loose. Indeed, I baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with a set as part spirit. So, obviously here we're talking about Yehoshua, and as it says in the very first verse of that, of that scripture, the beginning of the Gospel of Yehoshua the Messiah, the Son of the Mighty One. So we see that Yehoshua is declared as the Son of the Mighty One. But we need to understand what that truly means. We need to understand how this statement relates to the other statements regarding the sons of the Mighty One. So let's move forward just a few pages into the Gospel of John and let us get a better understanding of this concept of Yehoshua being the Son of the Mighty One. John 1, and we will start in verse 1. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Mighty One, and the Word was the Mighty One. He was in the beginning with the Mighty One. And all things were made through him, and without him nothing was made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not comprehend it. There was a man sent from the Mighty One whose name was John. This man came for a witness, to bear witness to the light, and all through him might believe. He was not the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That is the true light which gives light to every man coming into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made through him. And the world did not know him. He came to his own, and his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of the Mighty One, to those who believe in his name, who were born not of the blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of the Mighty One. And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory. The glory was one of, one of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John bore witness of him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. And of his fullness we have received, and grace for grace. For the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Yehoshua Messiah. No one has seen the Mighty One at any time, the only begotten Son, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. So we have a bit more detail here. In verse 1 it tells us this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with the Mighty One, and the Word was the Mighty One. So here in that first verse it tells us the Word was the Mighty One. It was part of that supreme being, that, that Godhead. And in verse 14 it says, And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, 
So again, we're now seeing the, the Spirit being, the Son of the Mighty One, being made flesh and dwelling among us. And we saw in verse 1 that the Word was with the Mighty One, the Word was the Mighty One. In verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. So, so this member of the Godhead, of the family of the Mighty One, became flesh and dwelt among us. And in verse 18 it tells us, No man hath seen the Mighty One at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So no one has seen the Mighty One at any time, but the only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So here we see a uniqueness. Yehoshua is the only begotten Son of the Mighty One. So he is unique, he is different, he is separate from the sons of the Mighty One. But we see that he is the only begotten Son. And if we continue forward just a couple of pages to John chapter 3, we can read this. John chapter 3, starting in verse 10. Yehoshua answered and said to him, Are you the teacher of Israel and do not know these things? Most assuredly I say to you, we speak what we know and testify what we have seen, and you do not receive our witness. If I have told you earthly things and you do not believe them, how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? No one has ascended to heaven but he who came down from heaven, that is the Son of Man who is in heaven. And as Moses lifted up his serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For the Mighty One so loved the world that he gave him his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. For the Mighty One did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of the Mighty One. And this is the condemnation, that the light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light, and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. But he who does the truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be clearly seen, that they may have been done in the Mighty One. So, what do we see here? In verse 16, probably the most well-known verse in the Bible. For the Mighty One so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Again, here we see the statement, Yehoshua is the only begotten Son of the Mighty One. And in verse 18 it says this, He that believeth on him is not condemned, he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of the Mighty One. So Yehoshua is very clearly unique. Yehoshua is identified as being the Word. He is identified as being of the Mighty One. He is also identified as being the one who came to save the world and the one who is the only begotten Son of the Mighty One. So he is unique in his role, in his nature, in his characteristics. But let us think about this concept of being begotten. The Bible is clear. When it says something is begotten, it means they are born of. So when, when so-and-so begat so-and-so and then they begat someone else, it's talking about them being physically born of that, of that human father. Here, we see that Yehoshua was begotten of the father. Now, there was no mother involved. There's no, there's no female deity in the Judeo-Christian tradition. Uh, much as the Catholics would like us to worship Mary, Queen of Heaven, that is paganism. But in the father figure, there is this, uh, this clear distinction between the Father and the Son. And it says that Yehoshua is the only begotten Son of the Father. So how did Yehovah beget Yehoshua? 
Well, we know that Yehovah is spirit. We know that he is infinite. We know that he is eternal. And if you think about it, we see something similar to this in human reproduction. When that first cell is fertilized, it then starts to split. And there are times when that cell, when the first division of the cell is such that the cell actually splits into two new cells. And that's how we get identical twins. Now, if we think about Yehovah, he is infinite. So if he split off part of his own spirit, that new separate spirit would be infinite also. When you divide infinity into two, you still have two lots of infinity. So when he, whatever he split off from his own spirit nature would also be infinite. When we think about identical twins, they have exactly the same DNA. They have the same physical body, the same physical structure. Now, through their life and through their experiences, they may have different experiences, different thoughts, different understandings, but their physical being is identical. And if we think about Yehovah begatting Yehoshua, Yehoshua must be identical to Yehovah, as Yehovah split him off from himself. Yehoshua must also be infinite, because when you divide infinity into two, you still have infinity. And then it begs the question, well, after this division process happened, which one of them was the father and which one was the son? Because they're identical, they're infinite, they are both spirit beings. Which one is the father, which one is the son? And at that time, I think there was no difference. And, and that gives us some understanding as to why Yehovah only did it that one time. Because if Yehoshua, if the second member of this, of this supreme family decided that he disagreed with the plan of the first member, they're both identical, they're both equal, they're both infinite, they both have the same power. I don't know whether they could have destroyed each other, but certainly there is scriptural evidence that the spirits can fight against each other and constrain each other from doing things. So we see here that Yehovah was taking something of a risk when he begat his son, because if the second deity that was created or that was, that was begat disagreed with the first one, the whole of creation would have just been locked up. So we can see now why Yehovah only did that once. And that's why he then had this second plan for creating the, the, the family of the Mighty One. But Yehoshua is the only one who is begotten of Yehovah. He is in his pre-carnate form. He was infinite, spirit being. He was the word of Yehovah. And he accepted that role. So between these two perfect identical spirit beings, one assumed the role of the Father, and the second one assumed the role of the son with all of the ramifications and all of the, in, the intent that, that created in the fact that the son had to come to earth, the son had to be manifest in the flesh, the son had to die on the stake. That was all his choice before the foundation of the world. So we need to understand there is only one son of the mighty one. But there are other people who are called the sons of God, or the sons of the Mighty One. Let's turn forward to the book of Galatians. Let's go to Galatians chapter 4. Sorry, Galatians chapter 3, and we will start in verse 26. Galatians 3, starting in verse 26. For you are all sons of the Mighty One, through faith in Yehoshua Messiah, for as many of you as were baptized into Messiah have put on Messiah. There is neither Jew nor Greek, there is neither slave nor free, there is neither male nor female, for you are all one in Messiah Yehoshua. And if you are Messiahs, then you are Abraham's seed, and heirs according to the promise. So in verse 26 we see this statement, For you are all sons of the Mighty One through faith in Messiah Yehoshua. You are sons of the Mighty One. So what we're being told here is that the, the New Testament church, the New Testament believers, were called the sons of the Mighty One. And as we follow in that faith, as we follow in their footsteps, then logically we should also be, be called sons of the Mighty One. But is that blasphemous? Are we claiming to be 
are we claiming to be God by making that statement? Are we claiming to be a unique, perfect, divine being by making that statement? Is it right to interpret the statement that way? Well, let's go back to the Gospel of Matthew and see whether we have the authority to make that claim. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5 and we'll start in verse 1. And seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see the Mighty One. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the Mighty One. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you, and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now, these are the words of Yehoshua. And look at what he tells us in verse 9. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of the Mighty One. So here Yehoshua is saying the peacemakers shall be called sons of the Mighty One. So he is giving the authority for this group of people to be called the sons of the Mighty One. But has that actually yet come to pass? Can we now claim that we are fully sons of the Mighty One? Well, let's turn forward to the letter, the letter to the Romans. And let us go to Romans chapter 8, and we'll start in verse 12. Romans 8, starting in verse 12. Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh to live according to the flesh. For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if by the Spirit you put to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, these are sons of the Mighty One. For you did not receive the spirit of bondage again to fear, but you received the spirit of adoption, by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The Spirit himself bears witness with our spirit that we are children of the Mighty One. And if children, then heirs, heirs of the Mighty One, and joint heirs with Messiah, if indeed we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. For I consider that the sufferings for this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of the Mighty One. For the creation was subject to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope. Because the creation itself also will be delivered from the bondage of corruption into the glorious liberty of the children of the Mighty One. For we know that the whole creation groans and labors with birth pangs together until now. Not only that, but we also who have the first fruits of the Spirit, even we ourselves groan within ourselves, eagerly waiting for the adoption, the redemption of our body. For we were saved in this hope, but hope that is seen is not hope. For why does one still hope for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we eagerly wait for it with perseverance. So in verse 14 we're told this, for as many as are led by the Spirit of the Mighty One, they are the sons of the Mighty One. So again we see the statement that would indicate it is valid, perfectly valid for us to be called sons of the Mighty One. But there's a point we need to understand. Although we are sons of the Mighty One, we have not yet come to be what we will be. Look at verse 19. For the earnest expectation of the creation eagerly waits for the revealing of the sons of the Mighty One. So we see that Yehoshua is the only begotten Son. We see that he is perfect, he is infinite, he has the full authority of Yehovah the Father. 
we see here that we have the authority to be called sons of the Mighty One. But we are not yet perfect. We are not yet immortal. We are not yet full of the power and the grace and the spirit of Yehoshua. Because there is another step that needs to happen. We need to be revealed. The creation itself is waiting eagerly for the revealing of the sons of the Mighty One. So although we are his sons, we have not yet completed that process. And let's look at the Gospel of Luke to understand how that process comes together. So let's go to Luke chapter 20, and we'll start in verse 27. Luke 20, starting in verse 27. Then some of the Sadducees, who deny that there is a resurrection, came to him and asked him, saying, Teacher, Moses wrote to us that if a man's brother dies having a wife and he dies without children, his brother should take his wife and raise up offspring for his brother. Now there were seven brothers, and the first took a wife and died without children. And the second took her as wife, and he died childless. Then the third took her, and in like manner the seven also, and they left no children and died. Last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife does she become? For all seven had her as wife. Yehoshua answered and said to them, The sons of this age marry and are given in marriage. But those who are counted worthy to attain that age and the resurrection from the dead neither marry nor are given in marriage, nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels and are sons of the Mighty One, being sons of the resurrection. But even Moses showed in the burning bush passage that the dead are raised when he called Yehovah, the God of Abraham, the Mighty One of Isaac, and the Mighty One of Jacob. For he is not the Mighty One of the dead, but of the living, for all live to him. Then some of the scribes answered and said, Teacher, you have spoken well. But after that they dared not question him any more. So in verse 36, Yehoshua told us this, Nor can they die any more, for they are equal to the angels, and are sons of the Mighty One, being sons of the Resurrection. So now this process is made clear we become full sons of Yehovah at the time of the resurrection. So, Yehoshua has told us in the past, no one has ascended into heaven except he who first came down. We are designated as the first fruits. We are designated because we allow the Ruach HaKodesh, the, the spirit of Yehovah, to lead in us. We are considered to be his sons, but we have not yet been revealed what we will be because we have not yet been resurrected. Only at that time of the resurrection is, does this then become fulfilled. We cannot die anymore. Where it says here we are equal to the angels, that needs to be correctly understood. It says we are like the angels, we are of the same nature of the angels. But we'll talk about that uh, a bit later. And it also says that we are sons of the much. So after our resurrection, we become full members of the family of Yehovah. We become spirit beings, we become his sons with the full authority, the full might, and the full uh, jurisdiction that Yehoshua himself had when he was here on earth. So that's another group of people called the sons of the Mighty One. We are designated for that role, but we have not yet been revealed into that function. Now, there's another person who's called the Son of the Mighty One. Let's turn back to Luke 3 and let us look who else is called the Son of the Mighty One. Luke 3 and we will start in verse 21. When all the people were baptized it came to pass that Yehoshua also was baptized and while he prayed the heaven was opened and the set-apart spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved son, in you I am well pleased. Now Yehoshua himself began his ministry at about thirty years of age, being as was supposed, the son of Joseph, the son of Heli, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Melchi, the son of Janna, the son of Joseph, 
the son of Mattatiah, the son of Amos, the son of Nahum, the son of Elsi, the son of Nagai, the son of Math, the son of Matthiah, the son of Semi, the son of Joseph, the son of Judah, the son of jo Joannes, the son of Resa, the son of Zerubbabel, the son of Shelatiel, the son of Neri, the son of Melchi, the son of Adi, the son of Kosam, the son of Elmodam, the son of Er, the son of Josi, the son of Eliezer, the son of Joram, the son of Mathat, the son of Levi, the son of Simeon, the son of Judah, the son of Joseph, the son of Jonan, the son of Elohim, the son of Meli, the son of Menan, the son of Mathahar, the son of Nathan, the son of David, the son of Jesse, the son of Obed, the son of Boaz, the son of Salmon, the son of Nation, the son of Aminadab, the son of Ram, the son of Hezron, the son of Perez, the son of Judah, the son of Jacob, the son of Isaac, the son of Abraham, the son of Terah, the son of Nahor, the son of Serug, the son of Ru, the son of Peleg, the son of Eber, the son of Shelah, the son of Canaan, the son of Arphaxad, the son of Shem, the son of Noah, the son of Lamech, the son of Methuselah, the son of Enoch, the son of Jared, the son of Mahalel, the son of Canaan, the son of Enosh, the son of Seth, the son of Adam, the son of the Mighty One. So what are we told here? Well, in verse 22 again we see this confirmation. And the set-apart spirit descended in bodily shape like a dove upon him. And a voice came from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved son, in thee I am well pleased. So again we see this confirmation that Yehoshua was the son of the mighty one. But look at verse 38. That genealogy, the genealogy of Yehoshua, his legal line through his earthly father Joseph, back to King David, back to the tribe of Judah. Look at the very last verse, it says, which was the son of Enos, which was the son of Seth, which was the son of Adam, which was the son of the Mighty One. So here we see that Adam is being called the son of the Mighty One. So now we see another person being called the son of the Mighty One. Adam is the son of the Mighty One. Adam was the first man. Yehoshua was the first spirit. Both of them were considered sons of the Mighty One. So those who are created by the Mighty One are considered his sons. Just as we are considered sons when we are resurrected in our spirit form, we will be considered his sons at that time. But there's another group who are called sons of the Mighty One. So let's turn now back to the, the book of Job. And let us go to Job chapter 38, and we will start in verse 1. Then Jehovah answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Who is this who darkens counsel by words without knowledge? Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you, and you shall answer me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me if you have any understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Or who stretched the line upon it? To what were its foundations fashioned? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of the mighty one shouted for joy. So here we are talking about the time before the earth was created. And it says in verse 7, When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of the Mighty One shouted for joy. Now, this is talking about the creation of the earth. It's talking about the creation of the universe. Can he be talking about physical sons? No, there is no physical creation. Is he talking about Yehoshua? No, Yehoshua is the only begotten son. Is he talking about Adam? No, Adam has not yet been created. There is no physical earth. Is he talking about us? No, because we have not yet been resurrected. So who are these sons who the Mighty One is talking about? Well, let's carry forward and look at Psalm 148 and see if we can find out who these people are. Psalm 148, and we'll start in verse 1. Praise Jehovah, praise Jehovah from the heavens, praise him in the heights, praise him all his angels, praise him all his hosts, praise him sun and moon, 
praise him, all you stars of light. Praise him, you heavens of heavens, and you waters above the heavens. Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for he commanded, and they were created. He also established them forever and ever. He made a decree which shall not pass away. Praise Jehovah from the earth, you great sea creatures and all the depths, fire and hail, snow and clouds, stormy wind fulfilling his word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all peoples, princes and all judges of the earth, both young men and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for his name alone is exalted. His glory is above the earth and heaven, and he has exalted the horn of his people, the praise of all his saints, of the children of Israel, a people near to him. Praise Jehovah. So who is to praise Jehovah? Well, let's look at verse 2. Praise ye him, all his angels. Praise ye him, all his hosts. And in verse 5 it says this, Let them praise the name of Jehovah, for he commanded, and they were created. So here he is telling us that the angels are created beings. And we saw before that those things who Jehovah created, so Yehoshua was, was created through the process of Yehovah begetting himself. Adam was created from the dust of the earth and animated by the breath of Yehovah. We will be created as spirit beings when he resurrects us from the dead. And here the angels were created by the command of Yehovah and they are told to praise his name. So we see that Yehovah created the angels and we see that the the sons of men were to give him uh, the sons of God the sons of the mighty one are to give him praise so let us understand why Yehovah created the angels because this gives us good understanding for the rest of the study so let's forward ourselves to the book of Hebrews and this time we go to Hebrews chapter 1 and we'll start in verse 1 Hebrews 1, starting in verse 1. The Mighty One, who at various times and in various ways spoke in times past to the fathers by the prophets, he has appointed heir of all things, through whom he also made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high, having become so much better than the angels, as he has by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. For to which of the angels did he ever say, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And again, I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. But when when he again brings the firstborn into the world, he says, Let all the angels of the Mighty One worship him. And of the angels, he says, Who makes his angels spirits, and his ministers a flame of fire. But to his Son, he says, Your throne, O Mighty One, is forever and ever. A scepter of righteousness is the scepter of your kingdom. You have loved righteousness and hated lawlessness. Therefore the Mighty One, your Mighty One has anointed you with the oil of gladness more than your companions. And you, Yehovah, in the beginning laid the foundation of the earth, and the heavens are the work of your hands. They will perish, but you remain, and they will all grow old like a garment, like a cloak, you will fold them up, and they will be changed, but you are the same, and your years will not fail. But to which of the angels has he ever said, Sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool? Are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister for those who will inherit salvation? So in verse 6 it says this, And again, when he bringeth in the first begotten into the world, he saith, And let all the angels of the mighty one worship him. And in verse 7, 
And of the angels, he said, who maketh his angels spirits and his ministers a flame of fire. And verse 14, are they not all ministering spirits sent forth to minister to them who shall be heirs of salvation? So here we see the distinction between Yehoshua, the only begotten son, who was there with Yehovah at the beginning of creation, and the angels who he says are spirit, uh, spirit beings whose job is to minister to his son. So although they're called sons of the mighty one because they are created by him, they were created to be ministering spirits, to be ministering servants for Yehoshua, the son of the mighty one, but also for those who shall be heirs of salvation. And who are those who shall be heirs of salvation? It is us, those who are designated the sons of the mighty one, those who are waiting for the resurrection, who the creation itself is eagerly waiting for them to be revealed. They are the ones who the angels were created to minister to. The angels will serve us, they will worship us, and they will be uh, they will be there to serve us for eternity as we go about our Father's business through the rest of his creation. And that now starts to set the scene why Satan hates us so much, why Satan's absolute intent and desire is to try and destroy all of humanity. So let us turn back to Ezekiel chapter 28 and let us get an understanding of the nature of Satan, so we can understand what's going on in the world. Ezekiel 28, and we'll start in verse 11. Moreover, the word of Jehovah came to me, saying, Son of man, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Master Yehovah, You were the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of the Mighty One. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardius, topaz and diamond, beryl, onyx and jasper, sapphire, turquoise and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the set-apart mountain of the Mighty One. You walked back and forth in the midst of fiery stones. You were perfect in all your ways from the day you were created, till iniquity was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore, I cast you out as a profane thing, out of the mountain of the Mighty One, and I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom for the sake of your splendor. I cast you to the ground. I laid you before kings, that they might gaze at you. You defiled your sanctuaries by the multitude of your iniquities, by the iniquity of your trading. Therefore, I brought fire from your midst. It devoured you, and I turned you to ashes upon the earth in the sight of all who saw you. All who knew you among the people are astonished at you. You have become a horror and shall be no more forever. So here in this prophecy we're told a lot of information. Starting in verse 13 it says, Thou hast been in Eden, the garden of the Mighty One. So we know our scriptures. Who does the Bible tell us was in the garden of Eden? We know Adam and Eve were there. We know the Mighty One walked through the garden, and we also know the snake was there, the serpent of old. So here we are talking about Satan. He was in the Garden of Eden. This cannot obviously be, um, be Adam and Eve because they were not created okay, um, by Yehovah. Or, or sorry, Eve, Eve was created from Adam. Adam was created from the, the dust of the earth, but here it says, the, 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 this, this being, this king of Tyre, saint in the devil, the dragon of old, was created in the heavenly place. 
It also says in verses 14 and 15, Thou art the anointed cherub that covereth. So Satan's role when he was first created was the covering cherub. He was one of the three archangels, Lucifer, Gabriel, and Michael. And he sinned and he dragged a third of the angels from heaven into sin and corruption with him. It said he was, set, he was upon the set-apart mount of the mighty one. He had the authority to walk around the very throne room of Jehovah. He was the covering cherub who covered the throne of Jehovah. And it says, you were perfect in thy ways from the day that you were created until iniquity was found in you. Satan was created as a servant of Jehovah, as one of the three archangels, covering the throne of the mighty one. And he was created perfect until he sinned, until iniquity was found in him. And now we start to get an understanding because later on in that prophecy it tells us how Yehovah is going to destroy Satan. It says he's going to cast him to the earth and he is going to burn him up in fire. Before all the kings of the earth, Satan and the devil will be turned to ash, will be burnt up into ashes. And he knows that in order for these prophecies to be fulfilled, Yehoshua had to be born of the line of Judah. And that's why Satan has persecuted the children of Israel so much to try and prevent these prophecies from coming to fulfillment. That's why he perverted Herod to kill all the young children um, in Bethlehem at the time when Yehoshua was born. That's why he tried to pervert Pharaoh to kill all the young Israelite boys to kill this lineage, to kill the possibility of Yehoshua coming into the earth. And now that Yehoshua has been and fulfilled his destiny, and become the resurrection of the dead. Satan is now turning his wrath against his children. Satan's desire is to see all of humanity destroyed in one final desperate attempt to stop Yehoshua returning, because it says we have to be praising him and his return. So if all of humanity is destroyed, there'll be nobody to praise Yehoshua, and that is Satan's last desperate attempt to pervert this prophecy. But let's see what happens in the meantime. Let's turn back to the book of Job and let us see what is happening. Job chapter 1 and we'll start in verse 6. Now there was a day when the sons of the Mighty One came to present themselves before Jehovah. And Satan also came among them. And Jehovah said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered Jehovah and said, From going to and fro on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then Jehovah said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him in the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears the mighty one and shuns evil? So Satan answered Jehovah and said, does Job fear, Yeho fear the mighty one for nothing? Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands, and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And Jehovah said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on his person. So Satan went out from the presence of Jehovah. Now that scripture is challenging for many people. Many people believe that there is this perpetual enmity between Jehovah and Satan, and there's this competition between Yehoshua and Satan for the souls of the dead. But here it says Jehovah was inviting all the angels, all the sons of the mighty one, into heaven. He says Satan presented himself at the same time because he is a son of the Mighty One. He is one of those angelic beings. And what troubles people is what we see here. Verse 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of the Mighty One came to present themselves before Jehovah, and Satan came also among them. And many people have difficulty reconciling the fact that Satan can enter the heavenly throne room. Satan can come and communicate, and indeed, by the look of it, negotiate and discuss these issues with Jehovah. And in verse 7, this is probably even more troubling. And Jehovah said unto Satan, Whence come thou? And Satan answered Jehovah and said, 
from going to and fro in the earth, and from walking up and down in it. Now that troubles many people. The first of all, there is only one mythical creature from history that turns up in every culture, and that is the dragon. Whether it's the, the, the symbol of China, or whether it's the fire god of the Aztecs, or whether it's the, the symbol of the Welsh people, or whether it's uh, in, in, in mystery as George of the Dragon, or in Greek mythology, or wherever. The dragon is the only heraldic or, or mystery creature that is, that is found in all societies throughout history. But if a dragon walked down the street today, we would notice it. We would notice that something is wrong. And so Satan, though, was able to walk through the earth. He was able to travel through the earth. And we know that the angels can manifest themselves as human beings in human form. So it must be true that for Satan to go about his business, walking to and fro on the earth, that Satan must be manifesting himself in a human form. And so we need to understand, as we go around our daily business, Satan himself can be walking up and down the streets. Satan himself could be sitting in the same theatre, or the same restaurant, or the same church, or the same school that we go to. And he's just waiting for us to make ourselves vulnerable, to allow him to tempt us to turn away from, from Yehovah. And if you remember what he said about Job, Satan was not going to destroy Job. Satan was trying to set Job up. So he said, see that he will curse you to, to your face and then die. Satan was setting Job up so that Job would break the law, would break the commandments, and then receive the punishment from Jehovah. So we need to understand that Satan goes among the earth, that walks around on the earth, and is waiting for the opportunity to bring us to temptation so that we will then suffer the penalty of, of lawlessness, which is death. So that's really an introduction and a summary to the study. But listen, there's one other thing, uh, one other scripture that now we need to look at, which sets the tone for the next couple of weeks. So let's turn back to Genesis chapter 6, and let us ponder this scripture and the impact that this has on us as we continue our study. Genesis 6, and we'll start in verse 1. Now it came to pass, when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, that daughters were born to them, that the sons of, of the mighty ones saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. And Jehovah said, my spirit shall not strive with man forever, for he is indeed flesh, yet his, in days, his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of the Mighty One came in to the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. These were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then Jehovah saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of the heart were only evil continually. And Jehovah was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So Jehovah said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing and birds of the air, for I am sorry that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of Jehovah. So in verse 2 we see this, the sons of the mighty one saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. And in verse 4, then there were giants in the earth in those days, and, after, and also after that, when the sons of the mighty one came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children unto them, the same became mighty men which were of old men of renown. So this scripture seems to indicate that the sons of the Mighty One, the angels, who were designed to be spirit beings ministering to Yehovah and to his son, came to earth, 
took female wives of the human race, mated with them, and from that mating they then brought forth giants. And it says in verse 4, there were giants in the earth in those days, and also after that, when the sons of the Mighty One came in unto the daughters of men, and they bare children to them, and the same became mighty men, which were of old men of renown. So here we have a group of people who have not got the full human DNA. They have the DNA of their mother, and they have some hybrid DNA, some corrupt DNA of these angelic beings who turn themselves into mortal flesh, mated with human wives, and created these hybrid beings. And we'll study these more over the next two weeks. Amen.